That's for you, by the way. Either one. All right. So I'm just going to test the sound and the live stream. Good. So those of you coming in, please keep coming in. We have sold every seat, so we're still we're going to start because it's 9:30, but you're probably going to find many people joining you in the next 10 to 15 minutes. Um, I just want to welcome you uh, to the sixth annual Wool Symposium, Wool and Fine Fiber Symposium. This, <laughs> thank you, uh, and welcome to Point Reyes Station. This is a beautiful location that we keep squeezing ourselves into every year, even though I know we are outgrowing the space. I keep committing to the location because, um, as you've heard before, I just feel like it has this very uh, powerful land energy that I think helps us birth some of the concepts and thoughts in a way that's very inspiring. And it's the home of so much of the food movement in our area, which we're using as an analogous roadmap to grow the fiber movement. And so it's really nice to be around all of these fresh baked breads and cheese, the cheese community and the dairies and all of these things that um, support and nourish our bodies when we come to talk about nourishing our skin and protecting ourselves. I feel like this Point Raised community is such a great house for this conversation. So thank you for making your way here. Thank you for coming from far and wide. And um, I think we will just begin. So uh, this particular theme this year is nature's resilience. And uh, the reason why we are talking about nature's resilience um, today is because this idea of resilience, it exists within us and outside of us. And um, we will hear today four core problems. So their industry that actually is now responsible for clothing human populations has done a lot of ecological damage to our planet. And we normally don't focus on that at these wool symposiums because we are the living, breathing solution set. But this year, what we wanted to do was just have the problems be a touchstone while we evolve the conversation around the solutions at a grassroots level. So this idea of resilience is that you'll hear the problem set from four different individuals, and then there will be a panel, a multiple group panel, describing the grassroots, I would call it the Earth's immune system. It's all these people in this community that are percolating new ideas and responses to these big global issues, but they're dealing with the issues at a very intimate community-based scale. So don't feel downtrodden by the problem set. Keep your heart open, keep courageous and strong, and just know that the solutions are going to be discussed in tandem with the problems. Um, so, what is this nature's resilience? Um, I was trying to define this idea because we defined this after this firestorm hit the North Bay. We, or before, actually, we came up with this concept of what does this mean to be resilient to these times that we live in? And what is nature doing to be resilient? What is she showing? What is she illuminating to us? And, um, and then the firestorms hit. And it was this amazing moment where we had this reality strike us of, wow, there are some great imbalances when you have 70 and 80 mile an hour winds carrying flames through communities and your fire communities fighting fires for decades has never seen anything like it. You know that there's something changed in the way that air, fire, water are moving around the planet. We have changed the way that molecules are moving and they are exacerbating conditions in our communities. So it is, of course, personally, we have to become very resilient in these times to these incredible changes. But we are also watching these greater geological and biogeochemical processes unfold. Nature herself is looking to respond and be resilient to the conditions that in some ways we've created. So there's a bigger, longer story of resilience, and then there's an immediate story of resilience. And these ideas of what does it mean to, um, to think about fires 
now in the immediate sense? Well, our community idea of bringing us together is all the money you spend today, 10% will go to fire recovery. Many pastures have been burned. Many people don't have winter feed for their animals. So we're collecting funds for that part of the community. Um, we are also interested in this idea that the fires in some of these oak woodlands are going to create a beautiful wildflower season. The ecology of our community, actually, there are going to be some very beautiful things that transpire with even the level of destruction we've just observed. And so um, human beings have for so long been developing their personal resiliency strategies as how do we respond to the conditions of fire, earth, mud, rain, snow. We're always looking to buffer ourselves. And this is um, a fiber shed photo with a bunch of um, scarves woven by Robin Lind, taken at the Berkeley Art Museum. And this is a response that we are having to our world. We're looking to create warmth and protection so we can self-renew. So warmth and protection, medicine, good food, this is all critical to our ability to self-renew as people, as a community. So our resiliency strategies also include keeping cool. We keep warm, we keep cool. And this um, idea that I've been thinking about, about material culture as a way to buffer us from conditions, to allow us to self-renew, to allow our communities to be strong personally and as a group, I've been thinking about how much our material culture and the creation of it has started to come to this critical historic moment where it's actually undermining our community's ability to be resilient. So we've developed these amazing strategies to stay warm and these amazing strategies to stay cool and these amazing strategies to move goods and services around the community and at the same time, um, those processes are undermining the conditions that allow us to thrive. Um, let's see here. Well, next slide, maybe someone can help. So our community is focused on right now um, how to move molecules of carbon out of the atmosphere and into the soil. We've tested 38 farms and ranches for soil organic carbon. We've done some modeling with the Godon Lab at UC Davis to understand what it would look like if we increase soil organic carbon by 1% in the soils that we've tested, that we have actual analysis for, because we are looking at rebuilding a stable climate and cooling this planet. And how does a community respond to this? How do we cool the planet in our way, in our place? So we can actually offset a lot of carbon just from the soils that we've taken bulk density samples from. It's actually pretty impressive to see the impacts um, and we manage uh, collectively with the 140 ranchers and farmers that are in this producer program, we manage 10 times that amount of land. But that's about how much carbon we could offset just with the land we've taken bulk density and soil organic carbon samples from. And I just wanted to point to Sally Fox, who if you think adding 1% soil organic carbon is difficult, she's in the room and we know she's at least doubled hurt the soil organic carbon levels in her soil just with no inputs but cover cropping and sheep. Um, so it was amazing to see her soil results and see that this is possible even in row crop systems like cotton and wheat production. And if you think that this is scalable or it isn't scalable but how could we scale, we took this idea of the, the idea of the French Ministry of Ag is looking at how can we sequester carbon globally with 0.4% soil organic carbon increases per year, what could we do? And if California just took the most managed working lands that we, the arable lands and the pastures, not the rangelands, we could offset about a quarter of our emissions in California just by changing the way that we manage these most intensive working landscapes. So soil organic carbon building is totally within the management of people in this room. This is what we can do best as a community of land managers. Oops. And this is how we scale. So not just through our community here today, but through the 50 international fiber shed communities and other communities organizing around food systems and energy policy, we can all do our part um, to scale this work of drawing down CO2 out of the atmosphere and building a very beautiful textile culture that doesn't rely on estrogenic compounds um, cost fossil carbon derived dyes and fossil carbon derived fibers and all these communities are committed to that. 
Oops. So I just wanted to share there, that the affiliate communities are responding to the climate crisis. And the communities in Canada are saying, we want to start doing carbon farming in our farms and ranches where sheep's wool is produced. We want to do this where flax is being produced. We want to draw down carbon and produce climate beneficial dyes, climate beneficial fibers. And as far as Melbourne, Australia, who we're having a call with next week, they produce some of most of the world's wool and with New Zealand. And so how do we develop climate beneficial communities internationally, all tethered, but all very place-based and committed to their people and their place? And so just before we go, we have one minute. I just want to celebrate what this community has done this year. We opened our first weaving mill in the beginning of May, and I hope Ryan Houston comes, but this is an amazing thing that hasn't happened since the 1890s in California, when we once had 12 mills. This is the first mill of this scale doing, committed to only weaving organic cotton and climate beneficial wool. It's the first mill this side of the Mississippi that does this, and now with the closure of Cone, it's going to be possibly the only mill doing this. Um, and that, that mill was not owned locally. So we have a locally owned mill, not owned by a private equity firm, so we can guarantee this mill will stay in our community because we are the owners. <laughs> and that's the opening. They have a dye and fiber garden outside the mill. This is the work that was done this year with that mill's climate beneficial wool with uh, Lonnie Estelle's Ramboulet from Modoc and Lassen counties. And so on the left, you'll see the designer, and on the right, you'll see what she or he made. Sorry for the panel, you can't see. And I just want to point out that that's um, indigo that I grew. <laughs> and those, this is when you can get a community together, when all the farmers, models, designers, and makers all stand on the stage together. The whole supply chain, except for the sheep, were on the stage. <laughs> Oops. So I just want to leave with this idea and vision that these regional hubs have what it takes to clothe you. We just actually need the investment and the commitment of the community to wear the clothing, to work with each other, to build the infrastructure. We have the finest material base we know of that we can do all this work. And you'll hear a lot about that material base today. But like I said, we just need the mills and the collaboration of the wearers, which is you, to pull this off. And I think we can solve a lot of these global, overarching, painful problems by coming together as a community and working as a team. And so, again, the problem statement is next, so we'll go back to the positivity after, but I do want to just point out that the global problem right now around what we are wearing, so we're not all wearing climate beneficial wool and organic cotton yet as a society. Um, with the rise of fast fashion, we've quadrupled the consumption of fossil carbon-based fibers. And so these lithosphere-based fibers are contributing to climate change. They are also shedding plastics into our oceans. And so the next speaker will be elucidating the problem around this shedding issue. And so I'm so proud and honored to have Rachel Miller coming all the way from the East Coast um, to bring us this narrative. And um, I'll bring, just come on up. And this is your speaker. Thank you. And there's one more slide to share. Uh, and then yours. Too many? No, you go to yours next. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really thrilled to be here. I am a little shorter. Okay, can, can you hear me? <laughs> Perfect, I'm gonna put this down. We are eating our fleece, and I'm not talking about the fleece that the awesome people in this room in the back row are talking about. I'm talking about the other type of fleece. Our clothing and our household textiles, they're falling apart 
in our washing machines, breaking up into tiny, tiny little pieces that we call microfiber, and washing out into our public waterways. This photograph is a magnified image taken from the effluent water of a standard load of wash, magnified. The mechanism for this problem that I'm talking about here is our washing machine. So this is before you get to the dryer. And I'm gonna kind of set it up a little bit by showing you some more magnified images. But first we'll start with, this is a thermal top. And here's that thermal top magnified. And so what you see with your naked eye is just one thread is actually made up of hundreds or even thousands of individual fibers that are potentially vulnerable to break. Here's a synthetic fleece dress, and here's black synthetic fleece magnified about 140 times. It's very, very vulnerable. The magnitude of the problem is big. Patagonia, the clothing company Patagonia, commissioned a study from the Bren School of Oceanography down the coast a bit, and they found that one fleece, and I'm talking synthetic fleece, jacket could shed an average of over 81,000 individual fibers per garment per wash. That was a two years ago study. A more recent study found that one polyester long sleeve polo shirt type garment could shed up to over 700,000 individual fibers. This is per garment, per wash. Oops. And they are escaping because there's nothing to stop them. Our washing machines don't have filters that can catch something that's smaller in diameter than a strand of hair. This is about all there is on a typical front loader these days. And honestly, it's meant to collect coins or uh, a dollar or my business card, whatever it is you happen to leave in your pocket. And so with nothing to stop these fibers, they are, in the case of being connected to municipal water, they're flowing out into the nearest lake, river, or bay. I come from Vermont in the mountains. We have septic systems and leach fields. And so the fibers are going to go into our septic system where they'll either enter the groundwater scenario or enter our earth that way, and we need some more information on that. Or when one septic tank gets cleaned, they get carted off to the nearest wastewater treatment plant anyway. Now, the consequence of this pollution is twofold. It goes to our public waterways. And there it gets ingested by creatures at all levels of the marine food web, from plankton all the way up to our charismatic megafauna, the whales and all the stuff that we make little animals out of. So, or of, <laughs> not out of. <laughs> so the, the two dangers are one is, is physical. Fibers form sort of balls together. They, they aggregate, they tangle up. And in the stomach of a very small creature like plankton, a plankton with fiber in its belly can starve with a full belly. There's simply no room for nutritious food that it needs. And so it has less babies, and the babies that it's able to have are less viable. The second has to do with chemicals. And these are chemicals associated with the synthetic fibers themselves, or the synthetic fibers themselves to persistent organic pollutants and endocrine disruptors that we know stick to marine-borne plastic. So all the same arguments that got microbeads in our personal hygiene products banned apply to microfibers. But there's concern for non-organically made natural fibers, heavy metals and dyes and things. And I am so thrilled to be here to learn so much more uh, because as I've looked into this problem, coming from, I'm a marine debris nonprofit person uh, who hadn't had a lot of experience in textiles, and I realized it just got scarier and scarier that until I come to a place like this, and I can guarantee you that my message is going to change after the end of today, I'm really excited about that, uh, that it's, it's pretty scary to just find out that it's just something that could be 100% cotton isn't necessarily something that you want to eat because here's the thing. What the creatures in our ocean eat, we eat. 
And it's been shown scientifically that this is happening. So Chelsea Rockman, in a 2015 study, went and got fish from a fish market. This is fish destined for our plates, and found that one in three shellfish, one in four finfish, and 67% of all the species she's tested had microfiber in them. And if you think about it, especially with the shellfish, you eat the whole thing. So it's not like you're saying, oh, we're not eating the stomach content. And for those of you that don't eat fish, uh, and this is as bad as it's going to get, and then I promise you it's going to get better here in this talk. For those of you that don't eat fish, we are not immune. This stuff is in our salt. It's in our honey, it's in our beer, depends on where your priorities are there. And finally, a new report determined that it's in our water. And these numbers represent the number of samples that contain microfiber in tap water samples from each of these countries. This is not a race we wanted to win. We are, unfortunately, on the top, with 94% of all the tap water samples taken by this group called Orb Media containing microfibers. But like Rebecca said, this is a talk about stating the problem and then sharing solutions. So I'm going to share a solution that our organization, Rosalia Project, we developed. It is called the Cora Ball. The Cora Ball is the first microfiber catching laundry ball. So we decided to go after this problem with something that was human scale, something for consumers. It, oops, there we go. It is easy to use. That's all you got to do. You just throw or drop it in your washing machine. And it cruises around and collects fibers. Now, we were inspired by coral. So after trying things that really didn't work, sort of filter, standard filter related things, we realized two things needed to happen to solve this problem in our washing machines. And that is we needed to allow water to flow and we needed to catch small things from that flowing water. And that's why a simple filter is not going to work. A screen with mesh small enough to catch microfibers will flood your basement unless you just stand there all the time, ready to clean it like three times during your load. So here's how it works. That's working. It swooshes around in the wash. It doesn't go against your clothes. It goes with your clothes. Soap disconnects things from your clothes and floats it. And that's where the coral ball does its job. It cruises around, and because it has these sort of coral-like stalks, and I'll be here all day, so come find me. I'll let you check it out. I also have one that's been used, so you can see what it looks like to have fiber in it. Here's one with fiber in it. Let's see if we can. So that's after a dog towel load. It turns out, we were kind of psyched about this, that it collects hair. <laughs> and you can, so my household, that's pretty handy. We also have two Newfoundlands, Newfoundlands of love. And, uh, but we have you know, dust bunnies up to my knees. So the thing that's interesting is that hair aggregates fiber. And that's good news. It doesn't fill up as quickly if you don't have a heap of hair in your house. It's harder to see. But the Cora Ball does aggregate this stuff. Now, the thing we're really trying to get, though, is something small. So this video demonstrates how the Cora Ball is able to use this kind of coral stalks and aggregation of fibers to get the smallest ones. We've just kind of picked in and, and grabbed one of the fuzz balls out. And here's a magnified image of one of these things. It looks like just a, a, a hairball. <laughs> uh, at least we're not having lunch right now. And when you magnify it, what you see is that you can just see the hair with your naked eye. But that the fibers that we're trying to keep out of our public waterways have tangled themselves around each other and that hair, and we are catching them. We were getting 5 to 15% of the fibers in a particular load caught in our in-house testing. Chelsea Rockman at the University of Toronto just did an independent test and got 26%, which we're pretty pleased with, I have to say. So Rosalia Project, like I said, we're a nonprofit. We've been working on the problem of marine debris for the last eight years. And when we learned about this problem, it screamed at us that we needed to be part of the solution. And for us, being part of the solution means understanding the problem as well as we can. And so in addition to working on the Cora Ball, we also set out last year to understand what microfibers were looking like and acting like in the wild. So we're East Coast-based, and we decided to test the whole Hudson River. 
And this was the first time someone's looked at a whole river and microfibers. We tested every three miles from Lake Tier of the Clouds to Ambrose Light. We uh, did half the, half the river on our 60-foot sailing research vessel and the other half hiking, whitewater rafting, only a small amount of trespassing and uh, accessing. Uh, we met some nice people along the way after we <laughs> sort of came in on their cocktail parties. So uh, the, while we were on the boat, we processed the samples by using vacuum filtration, and then we counted fibers. And the paper is, uh, I can share the link with Rebecca. We can post it somewhere if you'd like. But I can just give you the two big results. The two big results, one is just how much fiber is flowing in the Hudson River. We, our data indicate that the upper part, the non-tidal part of the Hudson is uh, giving, <laughs> transferring over 400 million individual fibers per day into the lower or tidal part of the Hudson or the Hudson River estuary. Uh, that's where the last good flow meter is and that's an appropriate place for us to give a, a, a good number, but that only represents 60% of the river. Now the other was a real surprise. We expected, and I'm guessing a lot of you would as well, that there would have been a perfect heat map where up in the alpine regions of New York there wasn't a whole lot of fiber, especially above wastewater treatment plants. And then it would get red with fiber around Manhattan. But that didn't happen, not at all. There was no statistically significant difference in microfiber concentration across the entire Hudson River. Now what that means to us is that there are other sources and that everyone is part of this problem and that everyone can be part of the solution. And I would love to talk to you more about that. Like I said, I'm here all day. To understand our solutions effectiveness, we also got to embark on a pretty cool journey. We went to the far, far north, I can't even see it from here. That star is in Svalbard, the Norwegian Arctic, inside the Arctic Circle. Some researchers from the University of Tromsø found that this incredibly cool little town of around 2,000 people, 500 households, called Longyearbyen, that is bordered by a fjord and a glacier, and polar bears on either side. There's literally a sign. You can't go past the sign without someone to protect you from polar bears. On either side of the town had a lot of fibers. That fjord had a lot of fibers in it. And they wanted to test the effectiveness of a solution. So uh, in September, we went there to the Arctic. It was amazing. And we gave the whole community Cora balls. So we're having the first community-wide test of a consumer solution to microfiber pollution happening now. We have all our fingers crossed. Uh, we'll get the results in January. But uh, we're excited to be part of it at the community level as well as asking individuals to be part of this solution. As far as impact, we calculate that if 10% of people in the U.S. or households in the U.S. use a Cora ball in their wash, that we can keep the plastic equivalent of over 30 million water bottles out of our public waterways every year. Now what I want to kind of wrap up with is some thoughts on the bigger picture and, and the role that different parts of the various industries can play. And I can tell you already from listening to Rebecca's intro, I've got some good stuff to change. Uh, but first just to think about the circular economy as uh, a concept and a goal and that the individual elements in that are to prevent leakage, so leakage of things from, um, so plastic into the water in this case. So that would just be making clothes that don't fall apart. Stopping the leakage would be what we were after, making sure that if things fall apart, they can't actually escape, so this would be our washing machines. And then closing the loop, it's something that we're working hard because the plastics, on the, well, I'll go back up. On the organic side, we've got the loop. Compost, regrowing, it's amazing. On the plastic side, it's just not so simple. And we are working very, very hard to make a pathway for our laundry lint 
to be upcycled. I'm really close. I'm not ready to announce anything yet, but I hope by the end, or maybe this time next year, we'll have a way for people to bring laundry lint in to a recycling center and have it get mixed back in at least onto the plastic loop of things. Okay, so there are four industries or opportunities for innovation that I see in this. And this slide, I think, will be one of the ones that gets changed after I get to hear what you guys have to say. So this really, obviously, is the textile industry, but the one that's dealing with synthetics primarily. And the way I see it is that there's opportunity for innovation here from the very level of chemistry. Could we mix up something better than something that breaks in the wash? Could we use a different process to extrude that resin and make it stronger? Could we weave it differently? And then finally, there's a role that clothing designers and clothing manufacturers can play as we learn more to say, it would be far better to not use acrylic because a paper just came out that said, acrylic sheds far more than polyester. And that polyester sheds more than a cotton poly blend. And as we get information like this, at least there are opportunities to make decisions that can reduce some of this problem. The next is consumers. There we go, that's how we are working. The laundry industry has an opportunity to play a role in the solution here. It turns out that uh, detergents have enzymes that could either release or suppress the release of fibers. I found that absolutely fascinating. Washing machines can be set up all different ways. We've written our patent to uh, be potentially in line, to have our technology in line. And I think what's going to happen is we're going to show this summer with another Hudson River trip that we're going to need double, double uh, filters in our dryers. Finally, the wastewater treatment system. There's opportunities in both septic system management and waste system or waste water treatment management where we might be able to figure something out. I am not a believer that this is the solution. This is not the solution. This is a solution. And I know that all of you here are part of the solution for sure. And so in the interest of handing this over to a panel that's talking about fiber, I thought I would show you kind of the fibers that we've been working with as ones that are flowing out into our public waterways primarily. Uh, so this is, this is a game. This is interactive. What do you think we are looking at? What material is that? Neoprene. Isn't that wild? This is one of I think it's beautiful, but kind of weird. OK, here's number two. What are we looking at? Any guesses? Polyester. That's a polyester. 100% polyester. OK, here's. Uh, Another one, somebody said this earlier. Yep, you got it. This is the nylon one. Oh, that was, oh, I'm, I think I'm clicking. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay, what do you think this one is? I'll give you a hint. I have mentioned it as a word already. Acrylic. Acrylic. Nice. All right, so this is the big shatter according to a recent paper. Whoops. Uh, okay, now what do you think? About, okay, so this one's a mix. Oh, God. I need to hold. So this is 85% polyester and 15% cotton. I think it's fascinating. It's really hard to tell the difference. All right, what do you think about this, this mix? These are all garments we had on our research vessel. Uh, these are all from garments we had on our research vessel. This one is more cotton. I, I don't have access to the computer. There we go. 65% uh, polyester and the rest is cotton and we'll finish with any guesses on this one there's a trend here 100%. yeah 100 <laughs> percent cotton is this one so uh i have to say uh, i think we have some time for questions but i do want to wrap up again by just saying how much i appreciate being here, this invitation to get to share some of the science of the problem and certainly one of the ways we're working on a solution, but also to learn from, from you all about some messaging and some hope that I can give to people. Because until now, my kind of message has been 
We can't clothe and feed the world on our agriculture, and I'd love to hear some people's opinions on that. Maybe we can if we're focusing on small areas first. I am a believer in lots of littles make a big, and I have had a lot of people at some of my talks say, well, I want to or I am composting my dryer lint, or I'm using my washing machine effluent to water the garden. And until I've walked into this room, all I can say is, ah, I am so sorry, but stop. Don't do that. Don't do that. Because the majority of our clothing is polyester. And we know the rate at which that is turning into like little bits of polyester. And it's part of that laundry lint. And it's part of that effluent. But I think I'm about to learn about opportunities for that not to be the case. So I'd love to take some questions and want to say again, thank you very much for having me. And there's my contact info. So if anyone has any questions, yeah, I see a hand right in the middle. Yes. Yeah. So the question was, are we working on a way for this to work in large scale, large scale industrial applications? It is absolutely on our minds. And I don't know if one strangely enormous Coraball is better than 10 in a commercial application, but that is a big yes, we are. We launched with the consumer version because part of our goal is to take this sort of newly discovered, but not newly around problem and to get it out into the world so that maybe we can inspire some of that upstream and downstream innovation. Uh, the greatest thing about working with commercial laundry or commercial applications is the consistency of the fiber that we get out of it and the opportunity to roll that back into whatever system it started. Yes. Okay, so there's three questions there. Our goal is that it will be made out of 100% recycled and 100% recycled material. Our reality out of the gate is that we are 100% recyclable, but not yet 100% recycled. It's pretty shocking, actually, when we finally did the test, what was happening. Um, that's a hard one for me, <laughs> but we're working hard on that one. Um, we clean it like you clean it like you clean a hairbrush. So you end up with these sort of fuzz balls in it. They take, it can take a while. It depends what you wear and a, a zillion variables with your washing machine down to the type of detergent you use. But you'll see the fuzz balls and when you see them, you pick them out. I think it works better the more you use it. So there'll be a bell curve of efficiency and I don't want people to feel like it's a burden. It's a problem of tiny little bits and it takes a while for those tiny bits to get uh, aggregated or tangled up into something big enough to see and then grab. And so you will learn what it takes. I think once a month, if that, to even clean it, just let it, let it uh, fill up. We d did a Kickstarter campaign back in the spring. It ended right around Earth Day. If any of you backed us, thank you. We did get funded. It was spectacularly successful. Um, we were three and a half thousand percent over our goal, which was absolutely incredible. And we're just next week going to start shipping out the rewards. So once we ship out to the eight and a half thousand people that pre-ordered core balls through that, um, we'll have them available. But those people, our sort of earliest adopters, are going to help us figure out the a real answer to that question is, how often? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So what do you do once you clean it out? Yeah, OK. So for now, when you get this stuff out, unless you shop at this event, the only option is to put it in the trash bin, like you put dryer lint in the trash bin. And it is better than essentially letting it go straight out into our public waterways. In the US, our landfills are better than not doing anything at all. Now, at some point, um, 
So if you know your clothes are made of down to the dyes, organic biodegradable materials, well then you've got something to compost or you can use the, you pick this out and you can put it in your compost. And I've never said that to an audience before, so I'm pretty thrilled to, uh, to, to have that in my repertoire now. So I've just been told that this is it for time. Like I said, I will be here. I've got Cora Ball, a, a new one and a used one that you can check out. We'll be kind of cruising around. Thank you again.